Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Well, it's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers on the phone is Professor Camille Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science by Yero University, Kanu. Good morning, sir. Thank you for joining me. Good morning. I hope um, everything, I hope the weather is good where you are. It's been raining here in Lagos. I hope it's all right in Kanu. Uh, here in Kanu, it's, it's very hot. Interesting. Okay. All right, let's get straight into the papers. We'll be starting with the punch this morning. And the punch okay. leads with Lagos Calabar Highway. Telcos fear shut down as construction threatens cables. And the writer here says undersea fire cables, fiber cables linking Europe to Nigeria pass through construction corridor and that is by Alton and at Khan. Um, what do you think about this? Because I know there's been a lot of, um, you know, construction going on with this whole thing. In fact, they've been demolishing buildings. A lot of the beaches that we have, the private beaches that we have in Lagos is, you know, cuts across this this highway that they said they want to build. And now it's not just the, the private beaches that are going down. Um, we're also seeing the telcos as well. They fear that there would be some shutdown as this construction um, threatens their cables, which pass um, you know, through this, this undersea from Europe to Nigeria. What do you think about this? What, does that, what would that mean for us? Because I remember one time, that was a few months ago, where um, I think here in Nigeria and in Ghana, we also had um, some, something like this where the cables, something had happened to it and there was no network for a while. People could not connect. Um, there was just a lot. So what do you think about this? If this construction might just affect the, 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 the cables that the telcos are talking about? In some places, so uh, the, the best way in any public policy is uh, for the leaders to sit down and assess the possible impact of uh, uh, the policy they are about to embark. Uh, I think this is, uh, it seems to be there is no much consultation uh, with stakeholders, and the job seems to be in much in a hurry. And uh, so this is, these are some of the implications that we are likely going to face. And, uh, you know, it is going to cost the country a lot of money. Uh, already the exercise has been started, or the project has been started with demolition here and there. And now there are other things that are coming, which uh, will have implications financially and in terms of uh, security, social impact, and so on. So I think it is high time now uh, for the leaders to, to sit down and see how they can address these issues so that they do not become very costly uh, for the country. Mm. So with this right now, do you think that the pros outweigh the cons? or the cons of outweigh the pros because i mean there's going to be de demolition of buildings a lot of businesses that are on that stretch um or known as the private beaches that we have are being affected now we're seeing that you know the underwater cables the undersea cables might also be affected so what do you think about the impact of this do you think there's more more cons than pros because i mean if you're going to look at anything any you know project that you want to have you have to look at the pros and the cons and say okay how does this benefit us um what we have to lose is it more than what we're benefiting with this so what do you think about this project as a whole i know that there are so many roads in nigeria that even need maintenance Talk more about having a new one. I mean, it's a good development. In fact, um, the, the people have come out to say, okay, it would bring you know more um, benefit to the economy. But what do you think about this? Do you think it's going to be beneficial to the people? And the sacrifice of you know all of these buildings that have to be gone, the possibility of the undersea cable being affected, is it enough sacrifice for what we are going to benefit with this highway? You see, we, we have to go beyond the mere impact of, you know, demolishing uh, buildings and uh, structures here and there. Uh, we have to put it in a wider context. That is why I'm, I say that there is need 
to have a possible policy impact assessment of the whole project. Because by the time now you touch on these structures, uh, it will also have negative effect on foreign investment. Because, you see, uh, it will definitely affect the uh, investment of uh, by certain foreign powers who invest. Now, if they are not secure, they are not sure about the stability of uh, uh, their own investment, they will not come. Uh, some who are already here will leave the country. So you have to look at what are the implications. That is why I said now that uh, since money has been sunk on uh, the project, we have started it, there is a way uh, by which uh, the government will now sit down, stop the project for a little while, study it and see how if they can modify it in such a way that they can minimize the cost and the implication of it. Not abandon it. Already we have started something, so you cannot abandon it that way. But you can modify it in such a way that uh, the cost and the implication will be drastically minimized. Mm. I agree with you. And I, I think one fear would definitely be foreign investors because We've been asking people to come here to come invest in Nigeria. And if we're saying that, you know what, the government can just wake up one day and tell me I need to leave this establishment, they want to use the way the road um, for a highway, then I'm not, I, I would feel threatened. I would feel like, what do I do? I'm, I'm not even sure if I want to invest in, you know, such a place. But we just hope that, you know, the government is doing all that is necessary. And, you know, the impact of this is, the, the negative impact is minimal, and then whatever were to benefit would, would be worth it at the end of the day. All right, so moving over to um, another um, story here. It says uh, on, the, on the top corner, it says, Tinubu to get minister's quarter one assessment report. So my question to you is, what do you think this report is going to be about? And if you were to grade, you know, the ministers on how they've done in this first quarter, I mean, we've seen, um, we've seen how the FX went up to so almost 1,900 or 2,000 even. Um, there's been fuel scarcity. The electricity tariff, you know, went up with over 300%. So if you were to rate the government and what they've done, I know this is um, the report, assessment report for the ministers, but if you ju were just to grade the government on what they've done in the past, um, you know, in the first quarter of the year, how would you grade them? You see, assessment like that is good, uh, by which uh, leaders should be accountable. Uh, you know, there should be transparency in terms of what they do. But uh, given the reality on the ground, uh, what we are likely going to see is a huge propaganda. You know, I don't think there will be any minister or any head of any parastatal that will come out and need, give a negative uh, report on his performance or her performance. And uh, but the reality is that uh, the policies so far have been counterproductive in terms of, uh, you know, raising hyperinflation, in terms of raising poverty, in terms of uh, making the, the living standard uh, of the ordinary Nigerian very high, uh, you know, I mean, very low, uh, you know, putting all these things. But what we are likely going to see is the usual thing. Uh, they will come out and give uh, rosy pictures about what they have done so far, and uh, then they will appeal uh, to people to sacrifice that uh, the, there is a light at the end of the tunnel. So this, I think, is likely what we are going to see uh, throughout, uh, you know, which is highly undemocratic, which is highly, you know, a state of denial. We tend to deny the reality, and by the time you d keep on denying the reality, you are not taking appropriate measures to address it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, for me, I, I, I don't know where you have to grade yourself. I mean, if you're going to have an assessment report, I think it should be other people assessing you. Um, if you're going to take an establishment, for instance, the HR would definitely send you an assessment report, um, not you having to grade yourself. But my question to you was, 
if you were to grade them or if you were to say this is how well the government has done for this first quarter of the year, what would your own score be? You see, I, I will score them as a failure because my position is that uh, the essence of government is to improve the welfare of the people. Mm. And by any yardstick that you take, uh, the welfare of people, Nigerians have gone down. So I think I will grade them uh, very, very low. In fact, I will grade them a failure uh, in, the quarter, in, the, in this quarter because what we see is the, the downtown of uh, the living standard of people. And secondly, we see policies that are haphazard. Today we say we are going to do this, and uh, tomorrow we change it. So these are all things which indicate that uh, actually they haven't performed. They have performed in far, far, far below uh, the expectations of Nigerians. Mm. Well, we hope that, you know, uh, th there's really some light at the end of the tunnel. I mean, they've told us to sacrifice. We've not seen them sacrifice so much themselves, but we just hope that they're doing whatever it is in their power to ensure that um, we have a better standard of living. We are just better people. We have all everything that we need so from the good infrastructure maybe with the highway that they are trying to construct now to quality education to health care everything that is needed so we hope that they take the welfare of nigerians seriously i don't know how i would grade them personally but we just want them to do more all right so there's another headline here it says dangote unilever five others caught 1,281 jobs in one year. So now we're seeing job cuts in Nigeria. In fact, first, they tell you there is no money anywhere. Um, there, are no, there are not enough jobs. But then even with the jobs that are not enough, there's still cuts as well. What do you think about this? And what does this mean for the Nigerian people? You see, this, this is part of the resultant effect of uh, hyperinflation, uh, which we credit on ourselves. So it's a self-inflicted wound. By the time the government withdraws subsidy, by the time the government uh, devalues the currency, by the time it has taken all these measures, uh, you know, uh, we are bound to see inflation because ours is an import-oriented economy. Uh, it is export-oriented uh, economy where you see when you devalue, when you remove subsidies, then you are, you are making the cost of your uh, product cheaper externally, and people will import, and then you will have more jobs and so on. So this is what uh, uh, you know the government has been denying, uh, you know, or refusing to accept. And, uh, you know, by the time we go into uh, the year, uh, one year or two years ahead, if we not change the course of our policy, we we'll continue where we are. This issue of our uh, job cut retrenchment is going to be a serious challenge. And at the end of it is, uh, you see, people will lose their job, and then there will be high rate of insecurity. And if care is not taken, there will be uh, challenges, you know, crisis here and there. So I think this is what the government needs to do, that we have taken so far almost one year, and uh, this is where we are going. So public policy means you sit down and assess. Now, this is where we want to go. What are the challenges uh, on our way? And uh, what are the implications? So what appropriate actions are we going to take? One of the actions is either to abandon the policy or to modify it in such a way that it will address these challenges. So I think what we are seeing now with Dongote, uh, you don't want to be a prophet of doom, but uh, we may see more of it both in the public and private sector. That is quite alarming, and <laughs> we hope that doesn't happen because... I know something um, people say is why there is, you know, terrorism 
um, why people are going into illegal means is because you know there's there's not enough jobs people are idle and they have to put food on their table whichever way so we hope that you know they have more jobs for people in fact more investors come in and then we can you know have more jobs creation and that way people are busy people are, can now put food on the tables all right let's just move over to the guardian quickly now there's a small headline here that says untenable fuel scarcity amid deregulation and then another one that says lingering fuel crisis worsening capacity utilization productivity says NECA. Um, last week was really crazy um, in Nigeria because marketers said they did not have enough product um, for the country and then obviously the NNPCL said you know they were bringing emergency um, fuel into the country for the next 15 days but then we're still seeing this fuel crisis lingering and now NECA is saying you know it's worsening capacity utilization and productivity what do you think about this and how is it even in your own um, location over there? Yeah, you see, in my own location, um, the clean stations are sailing. Uh, you know, the, the oil at uh, somewhere 1,100 or 1,200. So, I mean, the cheapest would be is 1,000 uh, naira per liter. Even myself yesterday, I had to go and go to uh, the cheapest that I can get was 1,000 naira per liter. So I think, you see, this, this is one of the problems that we are having. Uh, you know, the, the whole thing is there is this scarcity and uh, it is very expensive. And uh, at the end of it, we just are tired of blame game. And NPC will say it is the marketers, the marketers will say this one, and we don't see it on ground. So, and uh, by the time you keep on having this, uh, the already hyperinflation will, you know, uh, be super hyperinflation because already people have raised their prices, transportation, and other things. And one problem with Nigeria is that once things go up, they hardly come down. Mm -hmm. Even if they come down, it is going to be a very negligible percentage of the thing. Okay, so I think uh, uh, this is a, a very challenging thing that we, we are. We are in a very critical situation. Uh, after all, uh, the, 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 uh, you know, uh, money, people's capacity has, have not been increased. And I think there is this inflation. So I think it is a very serious uh, uh, economic and social problem that we are facing now. Oh, I know they said Dangote Refinery, you know, to start producing and then that would definitely even help with, you know, the quantity that we need. And maybe, just maybe, it would also help with the price. So maybe there will be some form of price drop. They also said um, Port Harcourt Refinery was to start producing as well. So I'm wondering you know, why we're still having, imagine, it's, I think it's quite embarrassing that for an oil producing nation, we are suffering scarcity f of the products. Why are we still suffering this even in 2024? And we have refineries, most of them are maybe obsolete right now. So I'm wondering what the government is doing to combat this, because I expect that if we have all of this infrastructure in place, it's just for you to ensure that there's good maintenance of them and we're using them for our benefits not that we're crying, saying, you know, there's no, there's no scarcity, um, there's fuel scarcity, there's no product, nothing whatsoever. And obviously, because there's a ripple effect of this thing, this product is something that is being used every day, is being used for businesses to thrive. So what happens then? Obviously, those businesses cannot generate revenue, and then, the, obviously, the government cannot tax those businesses because there's no revenue. So there's a ripple effect to it. Uh, these refineries we have for they could not even serve our own this we also have a uh, additional private one we are not going to see a change uh, you know sometimes i don't want to be like i say a prophet of doom but the reality is that even if they work, even if they are operational uh, with them and the smaller modular things, we are not likely going to see drastic change in terms of the price, the cost of it. Because, take it, you know, we import 
Urban, uh, like Longote and others, are supposed to import uh, uh, the uh, raw uh, material, I mean, from outside. And uh, you, you they import it not in Nara, in Dollar. And the Dollar is already uh, getting stronger, Nara is getting weaker. So it's a simple arithmetic, it's a simple calculation that where you Take, put one thing on the right, and then by you take it away by the left hand, you are going to have these problems. Okay, unless we have a kind of uh, integration between our own economic policies and uh, uh, industrial policies, we are not going to have any serious uh, uh, I mean, uh, policy that will address these issues. No, oh, that's quite, it's quite sad and unfortunate. Um, and I think these issues need to be addressed by the government because, I mean, <laughs> why not? We definitely want a better Nigeria and it should cut across all sects. Anyways, this is where we have to wrap it up on this segment. We want to say thank you for coming. It was lovely reviewing the papers with you as always. Thank you very much. All right. We're speaking with Professor Kamilu Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kanu. And we've just been taking global stories, making headlines in our national dailies. We'll go on a short break, and when we return, we'll be looking at our first hot topic, which talks about Nigeria's debt servicing. So please stay with us. <laughs> 